Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We're free. We're free because we know you. We're free. We live in a country that you have blessed. Um, and Lord, we choose to come here today to fellowship with each other and to be a church, to be just a small part of the body of Christ. And we praise you and thank you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you give us understanding as we study your word. Give us your heart, Lord. And uh, may we have a passion for what we learn today. Thank you for each person here. I pray for anybody who doesn't know you. I pray that they would hear and understand, could understand uh, the gospel, the good news that Jesus, you are the Savior of the world and what that means. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We do have, we'll have a man and a woman down here to pray with you, women f for the, a woman for the women and a man for the men. For any and every reason, any questions you'd have, they would love to talk to you. Anybody here, grandparent, grandparents, grandparents, isn't it awesome? I love being a grandfather. I just love it. Last week, I'm walking in church parking lot, and they have the nursery school over here, which my oldest grandson's a part of. My daughter's getting him out of the, and he's in his car seat, and he's picking up, Poppy, Poppy, Poppy. That's what he calls me, Poppy. I don't need to experience anything else all week long. That was good enough for me. It's great. And, you know, it's just different, because when you raise kids, you know, you've got to raise responsible adults, you know, contribute to society and make sure they're potty trained when they're adults and all that stuff. And, and, and you know, it's a lot of hard work. It's repetition. It's kind of like Chinese water torture and all that stuff. You know, grandkids, you know, you sugar and chocolate and fun and uh, send them home. And, uh, for example, Quinn, my oldest grandson, I gave him his first chocolate chip cookie, totally oblivious to the fact that my daughter, his mother, wanted to keep processed sugar out for another year or two out of his diet. And uh, sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So that's all I can say. But they are, they're a joy. There's just, there's something special about it. I'd like to take, if you can just think of that feeling for a minute and, and apply it. We're going to look at a passage here with the widow's offering uh, and where she gave everything she had, that there's a joy in giving that's kind of like being a grandparent. Just kind of. Okay? So just hang on to that one. Let's go to the, the, the passage that we're looking at today. It's just a few verses. It's chapter 21, Luke uh, 1 through 4. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw the poor widow putting two very small copper coins in. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Okay. Simple. It wasn't even a teaching. It was teaching moment, but it was just a casual moment, and it really wasn't even a casual moment. Um, you know, it's Jesus walking by, and I think he was doing what he did 24-7, and that was bringing the kingdom of God to this earth, to this world. Um, I'd like to look at this, but I'd like to look at some of the foundation because all these teachings of Jesus um, are uh, like pillars holding up a structure. Temple Mount, Israel, where the temple was built. The Temple Mount is, is not a solid structure. It's not the ground underneath. It's, it's supported by pillars and some kind of structure. And, um, and so it's, it's held up. The things that I want to talk about today are things like pillars that hold up the foundation. And um, in, in the New Testament, the, the phrase kingdom of God is mentioned, is mentioned 107 times. Kingdom of heaven, which is a Matthew version of kingdom of God, it's more Jewish, means the same thing basically. Uh, that's 50, 49 times is mentioned. It's a foundational theme that's throughout the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels particularly uttered by Jesus Christ. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. And it goes on and on and on. And, and this is part of that today, and I want to take a look at it. First thing, a little bit of, a little bit of foundation here. Um, Jesus' ministry on earth, from, for the three years that he was ministering, was basically and foundationally, 24-7, he was teaching 
demonstrating the kingdom of God that has come and is upon people now. It was predicted by prophets of old. It was predicted by the Old Testament writers. It was predicted by John the Baptist. And Jesus came and it was upon them. It was there. And so Jesus taught his way. And the world we live in is fallen and perverted. And so when we looked at the kingdom of God and it's coming, it almost seems like it's upside down. The truth is we're upside down, it's right side up. But when I was a teenager and I'd read, I liked reading the Gospels because I liked reading about Jesus, he messed with everybody's heads. He just did. You know, they said, teacher, you know, what's the most important, what's the most important commandment? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one's like it. Well, he didn't ask for a second one, so he gave him a second one. Nicodemus comes to him at night and says, we know you're a teacher, you have authority, and he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Now, when I was a teenager, I enjoyed Jesus messing with their heads just because I enjoyed it. It was just fun. But the reality is, as he brought that kingdom, it was so opposite, it was so different, that it was hard for people to accept it. And it messed with them, and, and religious leaders wanted to kill him because he was messing with their system, what they thought was right, but really was perverted and evil. So they, they had that, and there's, there's just countless verses talk about the kingdom of God. I just picked out one because it drives home some points. It's found in uh, Luke 12, 11, 20. It says, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I picked that one for a couple reasons, because all the miracles that Jesus did were all to point people to validate his teachings, that I have come, I'm the son of God, new kingdom is coming, and it validates all that. And he was being accused of being possessed by Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, and he says, you know, and he talks about kingdom can't, is divided, can't stand against, stand because it's divided against itself. But if he drives out demons by the finger of God, just gives this image of the fact that it only takes God just to whoop, whoop, lift his finger a little bit and the demons are gone. And it's a demonstration of the fact that the kingdom of God has come because it's come with power, not just words. Second part, Jesus' death, resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and that's the part we're a part of now, the church age. We're there, and we now look back to Jesus' teaching time, and we see it through the filter of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We understand. I get it. The disciples, when the, after Pentecost came, Peter stood up. And you could tell he got it. He got it. It was all clicking on all the cylinders. And now we live in that age, and so we look at all the teachings of Jesus, all the parables, all these simple stories, and this little blip of a, of a comment by Jesus about this widow giving, and we see it through the lens of the Holy Spirit, completed in, by Christ. And so it's more valuable to us, not less. It's a completion of the law of God. And the verse I want to highlight comes from Ephesians. And I'll read it off of mine. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And the fascinating thing is, it's past tense. He has raised us up and seated, past tense, us in the heavenly realms with Christ. I'd like to ask the question, Every time I read this passage, how many of you feel like you're seated in the heavenly realms right now? And the point is, and it's a kind of a mess with your head kind of thing, but it's, it's the kingdom of God. We are participating in that. When you accept Christ, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you accept in your life, you're forgiven of your sins, you receive the Holy Spirit, you're part of it. You're part of the heavenly realms, no matter what you feel, what you do, or whatever, by position, our bodies are here, but our spirits reach all the way up because of what God has done, and we're part of the heavenly realms. Number three, this gets fulfilled in Revelation chapter 20, the thousand-year reign. And it says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Jesus comes... 
At the end of the tribulation, the word of God comes out of his mouth, slays the armies, judgment is set up, and Jesus sets up his earthly throne for a thousand years, rules with a rod of iron, and what that means is he has absolute control. Everything is done God's way, and we get to be a part of that. It's going to be awesome. But that is the fulfillment of the promise of the kingdom of God, kingdom come. It comes and it's set up on this earth for a thousand years. Lastly, the new heaven and <coughs> excuse me, the new heaven and new earth. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for this first heaven and earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. That's that's Matthew or Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And it's my interpretation of that, which I think is right, but might not be, is that God completely wipes out earth and heaven, this, this present earth and heaven, and starts all over again. I've read some credible guys who think that's just a, it's a remaking of what's here. I don't care. I think God's got it figured out. And, uh, and so... The absolute fulfillment comes. All the judgments are done. Everything's done. Everything's satisfied. All accounts are paid in full. Everything is done. End of history as we know it. Eternity begins. Jerusalem comes down out of heaven on earth, which where one starts and stops, we don't know because there's an, it's a whole different way of living. It's a life without pain, without fear, without boredom, without, and, and, and we'll, we'll worship God and he'll, he'll reveal himself in new ways that we've never seen before. And that'll go on for eternity because there's no end to God. So we'll never get to the point where it's, okay, I've seen, I've seen both sides of God. I know it all. It's never going to happen. And, and we're never going to get worn out praising God and uh, having the party of a lifetime for eternity. I don't even know what that's going to be like, but it's going to be awesome. So you've got all this. I said all those things. So we get it in our head that when we look at little blips even like this, we can't just say, oh yeah, she gave out a sacrifice. That's true, but that's not the whole story. Before we go there, though, go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And Matthew chapter 5, I, I've said this not a not hundred times yet, but I've said it a lot of times. If you want to get a grasp of what the Christian life looks like for you, what it looks like, how to try it on. Kind of like going to Walmart, getting some clothes, trying them on before you buy them. If you want to try these things on before you get going in your life or get ready to go in your life, try these things on from Matthew chapter 5. It's about living a fulfilled life in Christ. So, Matthew chapter 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Might makes right. We all have a God-given sense of injustice, particularly if it applies to us. My dad always used to say, cut all the slices of pie equally, just make mine more equal than everybody else's. And we do have that sense. It's a perversion, but it's, it's inherent in almost all of us. You punch me in the arm, I'm going to sock you in the face. And, and, and rivalries and feuds and broken relationships tend to center around this principle is that, that somebody offended somebody, somebody offended worse back, and it kept escalating to the point where I'm not talking to you anymore. We can't have a relationship. That's natural to this kingdom of the world. And the Code of Hammurabi in the, would be equivalent to when the, actually before the Old Testament law was given, was a law of a pagan culture, and their sense of justice is, I'm a rich man, you're a rich man, and you kill my slave, and the law says, then I have every right to go and kill your slave. See the perversion in that? Inherently, wouldn't you hate to be that second slave? I didn't do anything wrong, why are you killing me? 
you know, and, and there's a perversion because it doesn't value people correctly. God's law perfectly values people. And the section of equity of justice in the Old Testament law is amazing. We tend to look at it negatively, and you, you'll know when I, when I say it, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, bruise for bruise, life for life, and it goes down the list. And we look at that and kind of think of it negatively. It wasn't. It was a stroke of absolute brilliance because it's absolutely true. That true justice, is, there's an equality and equity in that justice. If I bruise your eye, you can bruise my eye. If I kill you in cold blood, I need to be put to get death by the com- community if convicted. And, and that's justice. And when justice prevails, it feels right. We have an instinct for that. But think about this new, fulfilled Jesus, fulfilling the law, the beatitude, the beautiful things, and <clears throat> blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I worked for a guy, we put in fire kitchen hoods and fire systems, and he had been a mercenary. He was Mr. Macho, short guy, guy you would not want to mess with. Um, took a bear down with his rifle on a full run through a crowded forest, dropped him in one shot. Guy was good. And he would go to church with his wife, and then on Mondays when I would come to work, he knew I was a Christian, so he would tell me what the pastor preached on, and he preached on the Beatitudes, and he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And it it was just silence. I didn't say anything. And all of a sudden, he starts laughing, and profanity-laced words come out. He said, like, that's going to happen. Just a little more to that story, side note. I see him years later. He said, by the way, I'm a believer now. Totally changed person. So God is good. But, but think about it. Think about the fact, you know, that, that Jesus teaches you get whacked on one side, turn your other cheek. That's not natural. That's not this kingdom. Uh, the Roman rule, you know, if you have to, you can, the so, soldiers could make a, a person living in that country carry their stuff for a mile. And Jesus said, and they hated the Romans, hated. Did I mention that they hated the Romans? They hated the Romans. Just want to get that across. And Jesus said, well, instead of one mile, why don't you, why don't you give them an extra mile? And if somebody takes your coat or your cloak to you, or your shirt, give them your cloak too. And clothing today means very little. It's, if I need something, I can go get a pair of jeans if I can't afford them, I can go to my favorite place, Salvation Army, and uh, get them. And on Wednesdays, I, th- I think it's still half, buy one, get one free, or whatever, half price, whatever that is. I love it. And, uh, uh, but it's just a whole different kingdom, and, it, and it's offensive to us. And Jesus said, you've got to do it perfectly. He said, you know, and, and he said, if, if you can't do it perfectly, you can't even get into heaven. And his, and his disciples asked him at one point, well, who can go to heaven? He said, with God, all things are possible. And this, these Beatitudes, I just want to mention lastly, are often taught, frequently taught, I've said this, I've thought this, I've heard the teaching, and that is it's interpreted that these are ideals that we set for us. Meek shall inherit the earth, poor in spirit, and go down the list. And we set these things up, and they're ideals to be, that we strive for. I couldn't disagree more. I understand the sentiment. It's, it's nat- that's a natural reaction to those things. But Jesus said, unless, unless they're fulfilled, you can't even get into heaven. And the answer is, with God, all things are possible. And I'm not saying it's not, we don't struggle with these things. What I am saying, though, is the nature of the issue is different than striving. It's surrendering. So let's look all that roaming around in the scripture, let's go back to Luke chapter 21 and look at it through the lens of the new kingdom. Jesus is walking along. Somebody made mention, didn't get a chance to even peek at it, but that this whole time before Jesus says that, <clears throat> thanks. the whole time before that, he's being confronted by important people, Sadducees, Pharisees, and he's walking by, and he just makes this comment. So he's looking up. Jesus saw the rich people putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw the poor widow um, put in two very small copper coins. They were called mites, M-I-T-E-S. 
Uh, they were worth one one hundredth of a denarii, uh, which was worth a day's wage. So one mite was one one hundredth of a day's wage. Two mites was one fiftieth of a day's wage. So that's what she gave. Uh, it's fine to say she threw a couple pennies in the offering plate. Not quite e equal exchange, but good enough in the category. Not a lot of value assessed to mites or pennies. And uh, so Jesus is observing this, and the, the point he makes is, you know, it was the fact that she made a bigger sacrifice. She gave everything she had to live on, and these other people gave out of their wealth. And that's what, that's the obvious, and that is the true statement of what he said. But there's some things that have to be understood behind those things to jive with the scriptures. Because this widow didn't inherently please Jesus more just because she gave out of her need. Because if that was true, then scriptures like 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter from Paul, says, you know, if I surrender my body to the flame but have not love, it means nothing. And so it's important to have a relationship with Christ that love is the thing that is first and foremost. In the book of Revelation, when Jesus is examining and evaluating the seven churches, first one is the church of Ephesus, and he comes and said, you've done all these things, you kept my word, you preached. and he goes down this whole shopping list that makes me feel good about this church, I, you know, because they're, they're right on, they don't let false teachers get a foothold, all this stuff, he says, but I hold one thing against you, one thing. He said, you've forsaken your first love. And he says, get it back, this is my paraphrase, get it back, he said, or I'm going to take your, remove your lampstand, which they were the lampstand, which means that Jesus was going to wipe them out. That was harsh and hard, but it was true. And I think that applies to right here. This widow didn't inherently, okay, because I sacrificed everything I had, God loves me more. That wasn't the point. It was the motives behind the actions. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, that's the mentality you need to have. 5, 6, and 7 is what are the motives behind my actions? Good and bad, what are the motives? So let's look at the motives behind this widow. Obviously, she had the favor of Jesus in the comment that he made. Uh, it's significant that she gave everything she had. Uh, it is interesting. Just some thoughts about, is it harder for somebody with $5, or let's say $10, and somebody with a million dollars, who's going to have a harder time tithing? Well, I think, like the story of the rich man, uh, I think that the million dollars is tougher because you're giving away more even though you're left with much more. And when you don't have much, it doesn't matter quite as much. There are those things floating around. Set those aside for a minute. Um, I think it's realistic to say that most of us here at one time or another or right this moment would like to have more money. And don't raise your hands, this is not confession time. I'm just going to assume it's true. Most of us, uh, there's, and I think there's probably can be a handful of people here who are so content they don't want any more. And there's some people here that may be wealthy enough they don't want any more. That's, that's great. But most of us would like more. And, and, but just think this through logically with me for a minute. Let's say, uh, you know, like these athletes sign up uh, as rookies, they sign, you know, 25 million a year, 40 million a year, and if they're handsome or pretty and, and have good social skills, they get them on commercials and then they make some serious money. And, uh, and, and can you imagine? My favorite vehicle that I would buy in a heartbeat is a Ford F-150 3.5 EcoBoost. No, I don't think leather, I think I'd do the, do the cloth, four-wheel drive, obviously. And I, not that I've thought about it much, you know. <laughs> but let's say, you know, I had this endless supply of cash. Think of the absurdity of buying happiness when you've got more than you can ever spend. Think about it. I could have a fleet of F-150 pickups. It would be meaningless. It wouldn't be just meaningless. It would be like reverse. It would make me sick. You love chocolate? bite of chocolate's good, two bites, five bites is good, two pounds of chocolate later, we'll be going to the emergency room because your stomach hurts so bad. 
And, and that's not a lie. My boys have a friend who ate so much chocolate one time they had to go to the emer- take him to the emergency room. I think it happened twice. So, yeah. That's life. But God does give some people the gift of giving, Romans chapter 12. And that gi- in that gift are usually people who have been given God-given talent to be entrepreneurs and make lots of money. But they also have a desire to, to fund ministers, ministries, the work of Christ, the church, and, and there's a calling. It's a gift they have from God. And, and there's a reason why God gave them the ability to make money. It's so they can give. And there's a secret that happens with people who are very wealthy, that the only real joy they have with their money is in giving. I know people who have told me that personally. And I hang on to that. I believe that that is a foundation of the gift that all of us can practice. That this woman, I believe, is at the heart. If you get to the motives, what is driving it is because she loved God. She loved him. And, and so she gave everything she had because she loved him. Isn't that the greatest thing that there is? That we give our tithes and the discipline of tithe. I'll talk about it a little bit. Those are all important things, but they're not the thing. The thing is the motive behind why I give. Because I love God. Guy asked Jesus, what's the most important law? Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one's likened unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and he gave two for one, and there was a re- several reasons for that. But the first part is love God with all your heart, soul, mind. And what does heart mean? It's all, I think it's all that stuff together. It's emotions, it's our will, it's our experience, it's all those things. I think this, this widow gave to God, gave her offerings to God because she loved him. And then I think we should do the same. Whether you give a lot or to give a little, it doesn't matter. Do you love God? And next time you give a gift, we don't take an offering. There's an offering box in the back. Put it in and say, God, I love you. And the second thing is love your neighbor as yourself, which I think is given for multiple reasons. Even though it wasn't asked for, one of them is it's a way that we can measure how much we love God by how much we're loving and helping other people. I think that's a measure, a measurement. But I think it's also one of the things that in our giving, we become burdened by the needs of others. We become burdened by the needs of others. So part of our giving then becomes something, we wanna give something so it helps someone else. We give because we love God, and we give because it helps someone else. Then there's the issue of trust. Had a guy, you don't know him, you don't know this guy, so don't even try. This was in a long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. I was pastoring in a church and knew a guy. This guy was a businessman, successful, nice guy, committed Christian. All of his kids were Christians, still are Christians, doing well. We're having a conversation, eating some lunch together, having a conversation. And I mentioned something about tithe, tithing, and he chuckled, which, okay. And then he started to confess. He said, you know, I've never in my life tithed, ever, ever. And he's pretty successful, and, and I'm just, you know, I'm listening, and, you know, and he said, it's, uh, I, 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 just, I just can't trust God to take care of me with, you know, when I'm giving one-tenth of my income away. And, you know, he says, it's probably greed, and it's probably a lot of things, you know, and I, okay. And I encouraged him. I didn't preach a sermon to him. I encouraged him. I have no idea if he is, was, is, I don't know. And, uh, but I think among other things at the heart of that issue for him and for many of us are trust issues. Can I really trust God to take care of me? And, uh, and that might mean a lot of things and God works that out in a lot of different ways, but can I trust God? We have anointing service for people who are sick. Take that right out of the, the letter James. You know, is anyone sick? Call the elders of the church and anoint him with oil, lay hands on, pray that they'll be well. And anointing, I, I just love the formula that God gives because it's, I don't have to be a superstar, which I never will be, spiritually. And, um, and it's a prescription that the elders come together, lay hands on and pray, and you deal with sin issues. It's a beautiful thing. We've seen people get healed miraculously. We've seen people get healed through doctors. We've seen people where God had other plans. And, and we try to understand that the way it is. But the big issue for me personally is, and this is something that has come from years of experience, is that God is trustworthy. And I'm not saying I got it all together, but God is trustworthy. I believe that. And your giving 
when you give, and let's just stick to money, because I know there's time and materials and all that stuff you give to, but stick to money uh, for, the, for the point I want to make. And that is we can trust him. We can give away one-tenth of our money and we can trust him that he can take care of us. I want to make a little caveat here, just a warning. I don't want to spend a lot of time because my head will explode. Talking about the health and wealth gospel. And probably some of you have been exposed to it, but it's a false gospel that's preached. At the very best, it degrades Christ. At the worst, it's pagan. And it's, and it's a gospel that preaches, you know, if I give my seed money, which there's truth in what they're saying, but I give my seed money of one-tenth, I can expect a hundredfold return. And the issue is, you, you, you get all the religious talk aside, it's all about me, that how I can get rich and have all kinds of things on this earth. And I abhor that. And God does bless some people. And, and there's a variety of reasons, but that's not what this is talking about. This is a get-rich-quick, you know, I send, I send my $100 into this ministry, this ministry will offer up a prayer, and that prayer you will receive a hundredfold back. And, and I, I tell you, my head's going to explode thinking about it, because that gospel has been spread throughout the poverty of the world. Uh, Puerto Rico is an example of that. It is poison to Puerto Rico. The whole nation, the state of Puerto Rico, uh, has been poisoned with that gospel. So many other poor countries or poor populations in different countries have been inundated with this health and wealth gospel drives me nuts. Okay, I'm all right. This woman gave, and I think she didn't have any trust issues. Her issue was she really did trust God. And folks, I think there's just some inherent benefits in tithing. There's discipline to give one-tenth. Those things are all good. I embrace them all. I, I think one of the disciplines of one of the things benefits of tithing and one of the exercises of tithing is to exercise our trust in God. God, you can handle this. And he may take care of it in ways miraculous, non-miraculous, doesn't really matter. We need to, but we need to trust him that he can show us the way and take care of our needs. Awesome stuff. Um, so, what I'd like to do today to finish up is to give you the freedom. You're free to do what you want to do. Church I used to pastor in, I wasn't there long. I preached sermon and it's like if you're not tithing and you don't have the joy of the Lord in you when you're tithing that it, that it brings joy and, and, the, and you're not doing or you don't trust this church body, give your money somewhere else. I had a few of the elders come up after church and say they, they didn't think that was such a great idea. So, so, Tom's not here, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You're free to do what you want. If you don't want to give any money, don't, don't do it. God's not making you. You're free. Um, I would encourage you to give. If, you, if you, this trust has been an issue or you've been selfish or you lack faith, you know, whatever the issue, I would encourage you to take a step in that direction and, and do something different. Um, you, again, you're, you're in charge of this. If by chance there's somebody here who, who would like to give, but, but they think, oh, I don't know if I want to give to this church because I don't trust, I have trust issues, I have no problem with that. But I do encourage you to find some Christian church or Christian ministry and, and give there. Do that. Try it. Um, if you're given 5%, you want to give more, if, you, if you're looking at it that way, you are free to make the decisions you want to take. Here's some benefits from stretching your faith a bit that I think could help. It, it could help you with your trust issues with God. It could help you with your love issues with God that, that instead of it just being this mechanical thing where you've got a relationship with God, it'll get back to your first love. It can help with that. And when you go to give then and say, God, I love you, I'm not feeling it, but I make a decision, I love you with all my heart. Okay, God, I have trust issues with everybody. I never could trust anybody. I don't trust you, but I'm given this gift because I trust you that you can take care of me. You know, try it. What do you have to lose but a couple dollars? And, and so my challenge to you is be free. Don't, don't be piling guilt trips on and all that stuff. God sets you free. Be free indeed. What I want to challenge you with is out of that freedom, come with joy and, and, and give. 
And there are times, I think, when uh, we're called to give sacrificially. And I really think there's a particular blessing in giving beyond, up and beyond. And it's not the human flesh of doing that. It's the joy of how it stretches our faith. Uh, the joy of our, our relationship with Christ. And there is, there's just one last thing, and then we're closed. There is this cool thought. You know, we're in the kingdom of God. We're seated in the heavenly realms. Uh, you know, when you, you see those ISIS guys cutting the heads off the Christians and stuff, and I, I, I've never looked at any of those. I can't handle that kind of stuff. You know, there's two thoughts. Absolutely horrible. You know, we've got to do something about it, and I agree, and I still think that. But you know, those people are in heaven. They're believers in Jesus Christ, and they paid the ultimate price. And uh, you know what? Think about it a minute. Let's just say we're all right with God, and, and, and it doesn't matter if we live or die. It doesn't matter. We don't have to play the game. And I realize things affect us. I don't want to be, but, but the closer we get to God, the more we don't get taken over by the cares of this world. And I think one of the freedoms, freedom of financial bondage, and I'm not just talking about interest. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the bondage of a love for money is giving. It's a great discipline. It's a great joy, and I challenge you to do it. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for blessing us. We live in a country so blessed. There's some here who have lots of money, and there's some here who have very little. And Lord, would you help all of us to be content would you help all of us to trust you and to give with joy, whatever that may be? Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for each person here. I pray for anybody who doesn't know you. I pray that they would accept you as their Savior and put their trust in you. Pray your blessing on each person. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for the closing song.